even think about that? So I don't think about it in the sense. Um, so I just believe that one, we're all being smarter with like our training and um, technology and health the health profession is better so that, you know, like we we're better able to take care of ourselves. And so I, I believe I'll be able to wrestle for a long period of time. And I kind of aspire to do to, to wrestle for a long period of time. Um, but I don't want to wrestle full time, um, after this contract is up and that may change once this contract is up, right? Like this contract may be up and it's just like, well, I still, you know, I've still got the itch to, to do it, but I just don't want to, I don't want to miss out on my kids' life, right? And so, um, so yeah. So I like one of the things that I think too is that I am changing my wrestling style a little bit to be more like Nagata and more like Minoru Suzuki, as opposed to bigger bumps and that sort of thing. Like if you, you know, I think that the heavier bump taking style is less, um, you're less likely to have a long career with that as opposed to say a hard hitting style. Whereas like, you know, Nagata will be in hard hitting wars, but he's not taking, he, and not to say that he didn't, but he's not doing necessarily the top rope dragon suplexes and all that kind of stuff, which I think is the stuff that potentially, you know, when you talk to edge about what, you know, the, it's the ladder matches. It's those big, those big things that may have taken years off his career, you know? So that's what I'm looking at now from a longevity perspective, but also from a perspective of when my son is 15 years old, I'm going to be 55 and I want to still be able to do all the things that you do with a teenager, right? With a with a kid, if he wants to play baseball or if he wants to wrestle or if he wants to do whatever, I want to be able to get out there and roughhouse with them and be, you know, my dad was not that old <laughs> when I was 15. He, he, they had kids, my mom and dad had kids a little bit earlier, but he was... You know, he was able to to do those things to play catch with me. I don't want my shoulders to be blown out, so I can't I can't throw a ball from for for my kids when they want to play baseball. You know what I mean? So so yeah. So I I look at those as inspiration, but I also look at people like Tom Brady and LeBron James. You know, Tom Brady. You know, who just I don't know when it was announced that he was going to retire, and uh, you know the the work that he's put in and like LeBron James when LeBron James came out and said he spends a million dollars on his body every wow. year um he said like he to, just so that he can continue to play basketball at the highest level that was really there was really a light switch that went off in my head because I am a very frugal human being who does not like to spend money on anything and uh, and and almost consider it a point of pride, right? So <laughs> I so my wife and I when I main evented WrestleMania at WrestleMania 30, uh, Bree and I shared a 2010 Honda Fit that didn't have automatic locks, and that was a source of pride for me as far as like I bet there's nobody ever who's main evented wrestlemania who has a car like this right <laughs> like like it's uh and so so anyways but when i heard lebron james say that and it just made so much sense to me and you know john cena had mentioned he didn't mention it to me but he just kind of said it he said you you have to spit like he got the bus so he got the bus that not because like oh i'm a superstar i should be in a bus he got the bus so that he could sleep better and that so because that was the only way that he would be able to continue doing what he does. And um, I in no way, shape or form need a bus, but spending money on my body um, is is something that I've only recently, like in the last year and a half, two years has been something that I've really like I've really kind of invested in. When it comes to, because one of the things I've noticed is from a cosmetic standpoint, you look in the best shape you've looked in in a long, long time at, you know, and is it, as far as like the training that you've been doing, have you changed the training or do you just have more time because you're wrestling less dates and you're home more? I mean, what would you attribute that to? So uh, one, one motivation um, as part of it, but then two, so I've always, when, um, 
when I was in WWE, I was always trying to keep muscle on, you know, and that's a struggle for me. I'm not somebody who just naturally puts on a lot of muscle. So in doing that, so trying to be, so if I was 195 or 200 pounds, that's, that's hard for me to maintain that weight. I have to lift heavier. I have to eat more, all that kind of stuff. I think I just look better at 180, 185 pounds. And there's no pressure to be bigger because in AEW, the wrestlers are smaller and it's more about your performance anyways. So I think that's kind of the main thing. My training has changed substantially, but it's been like that for a couple of years. Like when I came back um, after the retirement, like I've really... And my wife makes fun of me because I'll be at the gym for an hour and a half to two hours or now, you know, um, we have a, a gym kind of in our garage because of COVID, but, uh, it takes me an hour and a half to two hours to work out. And she makes fun of me because it's like only 45 minutes of that is actually working out. The first, the first part is warming up. And then the last today, I mean, I, I did mobility and movement work. And the cool down for that was 40 minutes. <laughs> so it was like, it's not even like a workout day. And I was, you know, and I was, but, but that's inspired by a lot of the Tom Brady stuff. And like, okay, what do you, what are you doing? How are you training? Like Tom Brady's thing was, I don't care how I look aesthetically. And for wrestlers, you know, that's a little bit different, but it's training. So I am training so that I can play football at the highest level for as long as I possibly can. And that's what I do now is I just, I train so I can, wrestle the way that I'd like to wrestle uh, for as long as I possibly can. I, one thing that you, one, one person who you've talked about um, a decent amount in some recent interviews is Jade Cargill. And, um, and I, and I guess you are helping train her in wrestling and what's kind of your thoughts. I mean, she's someone who, you know, kind of, I mean, she's obviously a phenomenal athlete and has a very unique look and very marketable look. And, you know, I mean, she's learning on the job on national television, not like how you learned on the job where the first couple of years, I mean, virtually nobody saw you, you know, I mean, or, or you know, we were on maybe local television in, in some of those places or WWE developmental before they had television and that road, you know, a little bit of Japan, but not not on national TV in Japan until you had many years in, um, you know, what, what's kind of your thoughts on, on training her and, um, you know, you've said a lot of nice things about her. Yeah, she's, uh, she's a really hard worker. She's really smart. She, um, she's, she's somebody who's willing to put in the work. You know, I, I don't want to like, I don't want to talk too much about her because one, I don't want to put any more pressure on her. That's all than there already is. Like she's, she just, I think, had her one year anniversary from her first match just recently. And now she's in her first pay-per-view match on the, on one of the most loaded pay-per-view cards of all time. I don't want to put any more pressure on her. Right. (laughs) You know, uh, but, but I just, so it's weird because, you know, I think she's great, but I also have a deep kind of sympathy for the position that she's put in because not only is it, not only is it, a lot of pressure for her experience level, but we're also in a different age than we were in 1999 where social media feels like they can attack you on any small mess up, right? Where it's just like, if you go online after even a really good match, you know, if it's not, if it's not great, right. Um, I don't know how many people, uh, attack me about my matches on you know online i don't really go on (laughs) but but i'm sure there are right but like um but any little slip up or anything that's not perfect and and people just start criticizing and and all that kind of stuff so we're at an age and we're also at an age where people are paying attention to it right so it's not like you know um we saw the the stuff with hana kimura which was so sad that um that people people feel on social media that with the with somebody who's on tv or whatever it is that they can just attack and attack and just say the meanest things or whatever it is, not, not putting into account how hard that per- person's working or that what other people say might be affecting them and all that kind of stuff. And so, it, you know, I like, I don't know. I just have, 
I have a real, real sympathy for, I mean, not just Jade, but like almost this entire generation of younger wrestlers who are, who are trying to come up, who are, if you're coming up on TV right now, I think that's one of the, one of the cool things about say like Daniel Garcia and Lee Moriarty and those kind of guys is that they're also doing some other things outside so that not, so they're, they're working on things that aren't necessarily in the spotlight. And so, but yeah, I just, I don't know. I, I just have a real, real sympathy for, for almost this entire generation. I'm, uh, <laughs> so I, I, I said it and maybe I shouldn't have said it in, uh, that in another, in another podcast thing, but I said that I don't run my social media and Dave, you know that. <laughs> cause I, 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 I know that, but yeah, but my social media manager has been talking to you, I think on my Twitter or whatever it is. And so it's, um, and so it's, uh, it's, I kind of think one, one, I'm trying to think of my responsibility to the world and, um, that sort of thing. I, I've talked to my, my manager, uh, about like, Hey, what if I made my social media, like I'm doing like an anti-social media, social media campaign. (laughs) (laughs) And it's just like, and it's, you know, it's just bringing up the absurdity of like, hey, maybe, maybe be kind or, or maybe get off social media and, and go do something with your friends or limit the amount of time you spend on social media. Like I get that there are certain things that are positive about social media, but I'm finding it to be when the people I know that are talking about it it brings up more negativity than anything else. And at that point it's no longer, um, no, it's no longer serving us. It's no longer a technology that's serving us. And it's a technology that is, is serving, serving other people's interests, you know, rather than the masses who are on it. So there's a great book called stolen focus by, uh, Johan Hari that just recently came out that talks about how, like, what if instead of, and I get that these companies have to make money, but like, what if Facebook, instead of having algorithms that are designed to keep you on Facebook, what if they had things that like, okay, when you got logged onto Facebook, you saw whatever your friends or family, maybe pictures or whatever, but then inspired you to, to get off Facebook and connect with those people in real life, you know? But then that would get you off of Facebook. <laughs> so it's like, you know, so you it's know. like oh, they're, they're not gonna, they're not gonna, do, they're not gonna do that. You know, so it's a, it's a. I've read a lot in the last couple of years about, you know, there's a lot of like phone addiction. You see it all over the place. People looking at their phones, like, you know, all, <laughs> all sorts of, all sorts of, and I think all sorts of problems are stemming from that. You know, and especially you know the rise in depression and all you know it's just not how humans are supposed to live staring at a screen so wait wait till you have wait till you have teenagers well yeah i mean that's that's a fear right that's a fear that i have and especially so one of the things that um this was brought to my attention a couple years ago which is actually what which made me tackle how much time i spend on my phone is this concept of like okay kids are going to grow up from the time that they're babies before they learn how to walk. They look at the adults around them, which are the people that even subconsciously you're just going to take in what they, they do and, and say, but you see them constantly staring down at these devices and not looking up at the world around them. And how is that going to affect their psyche as far as what's important in life? And so that's when I, I made a conscious decision to, uh, keep my screen time to less than an hour a day. Some days I go over it today. I certainly will because this is a Skype call. And so this, is, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that's like, um, yeah, it's something that I, I'm starting to feel really strongly about, but I'm also trying to be aware of like, people feel very strongly about really stupid things. And I hope this, <laughs> I hope this isn't one of them. <laughs> so I'm hoping, I'm hoping I, I'm surrounded by enough people who will say like, Hey, Hey man, maybe this isn't a big deal. Maybe you should let it go a little bit. <laughs> you know, you know, it's it's a funny thing because um, almost every celebrity that I'm aware of has a, 
you know, I'm not saying they hate social media, but they have a hatred for an aspect of social media and they probably should in a sense too, but you just kind of have to, and it takes time. And also I think the nature of someone who's really good at something, um, because you're so passionate and it becomes, you'd almost, almost becomes like your, your being, and then you're criticized for like ridiculous things. It can get really weird and you have to learn how to just like laugh. You know, which is, you know, what took me a while. But I mean, I, that's what I do now is I just like laugh at it. But and, and the reality is, is most of the interaction is positive. But, you know, it's like if if you are passionate about your thing and 95 percent of the stuff is positive and 5 percent is negative, it is very easy to dwell on that 5 percent. And, and instead of saying, like, you know what, it's 5 percent and you're never going to please that 5 percent. So who cares anyway? But um yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, and, 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 but, but yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're someone who's prone to depression, social media is, is, and you're a celebrity too. And I think that, I think that there's something, and I don't know, like you, and you might know this, understand this better than me, but I, I've noticed this from, and not, not just, um, with wrestlers, but with high level athletes, um, in other sports that I, my empirical, observation is that depression is higher with super successful people than people who are not as successful. And I don't mean super successful when it comes to money. That's different. Super successful as far as being great at their craft. I think that there's something where that lends to it. And then if you compound social media, you know, that, that aspect of social media that will be negative if you're famous, it can be, you know, unless you just go in there with the idea that like, um, if I don't know this person and I, I'm not someone who like, like put this way, like, like if I have something going on in my life, I'll call Garrett and I'll go with Garrett, blah, 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 blah. Right. So if he tells me something's bad, I'm going to listen to him. But if it's somebody who I don't know, I mean, it's just like, I wouldn't call him for advice. So what does this advice matter to me? Yeah, you know, so, you know uh, what I, mean? so I was, I was, uh, uh, we were actually having this conversation yesterday, uh, about social media and, um, one, th one thing that I like to think of is, so say you're trying, say you're trying to be, uh, like, like, be, uh, a physics person, right. And you're going to get your doctorate in physics, but you have to submit your, um, your doctoral thesis, right. You submit it to a professor. You don't submit it to Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> and and then gauge how good your doctoral thesis is on physics to a bunch of people who don't know anything about physics, right? Like that's not, that's not what you do. You submit it to like, okay. And you don't, that's the, your professor and maybe, you know, esteemed colleagues or people that you've, you know, gone through school with, Hey, what do you think of this? Do you think anything I could change? Whatever that sort of thing. But you're not just going to submit it to the masses who don't know anything about what you're doing and just open yourself up to that kind of criticism. Right. <laughs> so, like, so that's, that's kind of, uh, how, how I look at social media, although that, you know, it's hard because I also don't want to be the grumpy, old, the grumpy guy and say, ah, oh, these kids today on their social media back in my day, <laughs> I used to count the grass, you know, and like, you, know, you just, you did, just did, can't did, do that. Did you grow up playing in the streets? Because the one thing, and it still it still exists, but my God, when I drive around, I don't see kids playing in the streets. And when I was growing up, that's all we did. You know, I mean, it's like a little bit so it's so long, so far ago. You know what I mean? When you talk about like sitting on the phone, because we didn't have that. Um, you know what I mean? And it's like, yeah. it's like, and and of course, you always believed the way you were raised was the best. And and I and I actually do believe that that like. Uh, I mean, you know, there's certain positive aspects of everything, but that's that's a different thing. But like, when you when you grew up, did you play in the streets a lot, or well, play so, in the park, or whatever it would be outside the house? Is what I mean. Yeah, so I grew up in a small town, um, Aberdeen, Washington, which only has about fifteen thousand people, and we get eighty two inches of rain a year, and there's lots of like woods and forest around. It's a logging community, and so I spent a lot of my time in the woods, and. Um, and I also think that that's, I do believe that that's, that's healthy, but I'm also, you know, like, I don't know, there's a lot of research to suggest that having open time for your brain, like open space, 
where you're not where where you're not actively seeking, right? Where you're not like looking at a phone, looking where there's no inputs coming in other than just like fresh air or whatever it is, but you just let your mind wander. That that's very helpful for your brain, right? And it's very helpful for development, and it's very helpful for creativity. You know, they like to talk about um, Charles Darwin when he came up with his theory of evolution. You know, he went and did his study at the Galapagos Islands and all that kind of stuff. But where he really formulated the the idea or the the thesis on it was just aimlessly walking on his property. And just thinking, you know, and he was just, uh, you know, like these things going on in his brain and just letting your mind just go to whatever places it wants to go, whatever things really interest you rather than I need to be entertained by this or I need to be entertained by that. Um, One of my concerns about continuing with pro wrestling is that I feel like we're over entertained, like the last thing anybody needs. You know, one of the things people have told have told me is this idea that like, you know, when I say like, I don't feel like my job is super important. Um, they say like, Oh, but it, it really helps like people who are in a lot of pain or in need or think of the kids with make a wish and all that kind of stuff. And I do think, I mean, that's the, that's the best thing I've ever done in my life, you know, is, is the stuff like with Connor from Connor's cure and right. Uh, the kids that I've met with, with that, you know, one of the things, um, that I most respect about John Cena is all those make wishes he's done. And you never hear him talk about it. He is, yeah. he does it solely for those kids. And so anyways, um, but other than those kind of people, we're all over entertained. We don't need more entertainment. <laughs> we, we need, we need less. And, um, and so, but I don't know. Now we're getting into things that wrestling fans might not be interested in. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. And also, I, I would like to say this. If you're listening to this, you should also be questioning, why should I listen to a pro wrestler's thesis on how my life should be at any given point? <laughs> I, do, I do have a theory about what Dave was, was talking about, and then we can move on to, to other stuff, but... Dave, you know, I'm I'm a few years older than uh, than Brian, but I very much remember a lot of the commercials and a lot of the um, information coming out was they were like these kidnappers were kind of like becoming a big deal and you'd hear about them in the news. And so I think a yeah. lot of families were like, oh, we're very afraid of letting our kids just roam around the neighborhood. And then also I think what happened is uh, – Lots of um, uh, you. Both parents had to start working, and so you remember in the eighties, in the mid eighties, the latchkey kids, right, where the kids would have to come home and mom or dad wasn't there because they were both out there working. I think those two things kind of uh, made it so that kids are, you know, were inside the house way more, and that happened. Like, that's right in you know, right in the mid to late eighties when all of that that stuff started to happen. So I think that's a, a big part of why, but, um, yeah. So just, just to touch on that, um, gosh, this is getting way off topic, but it's so, much, it's so much fun. Like, this is just like the conversation. These are the things that I really enjoy, but, um, Rucker Bregman and Yuval Noah Harari, uh, have both come out with really good books, um, where they talk about where the increase in kidnapping is a deception. It's actually, there's just more news. There's actually less kidnapping than ever before. And, and so that's an interesting thing, but there is you know, a, a lot, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of kidnapping is, this list is kidnapping is also not actually kidnapping as much as, um, uh, divorced parents, you know, that, that freak out. Yeah. And so, but then I also, I also don't want to be like, Hey, Oh, don't worry about it. Let your kids do whatever. Because, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, because it does exist, all, yeah. Yeah. But all, because also, um, my wife has a friend whose niece was just kidnapped and then they, they found, they, they found her and like, and it was, you know, like a, this online thing, whatever it is. But I also, you know, so like I, you have to be very judicious and you, you'll read this thing. It's like, Oh, well the statistics are actually down, but then it's like, okay. But, they do, we, but it does exist. Yeah. So, yeah. All right, so yeah. This- I apologize in advance for how long the setup to this next question is going to be. Um, okay. <laughs> so, so, okay, so 
uh, because of your career and all the places that you worked, uh, when fans tell you, you know, when they first started watching your career, I'm sure there's so many different entry points because I can remember reading about you in The Observer, but back in like the mid 2000s, I had two young kids, you know, really work focused and I pretty much only had time to watch WWE. I wasn't ordering DVDs from, from ROH or anything. Uh, but I had a buddy, uh, his name is Danny. He sent me some of your DVDs and he's like, just watch Brian. Now I'm sure these were burned. So, you know, probably don't get any, any money from, from these copies, but he's like, you'll love him. And so by the time you did make it to WWE for me, I was like, Oh, that's my guy because I've been watching him for several years now. And I imagine your fans can come from anywhere, you know, from the beginning to uh, through now that you're, I'm sure you're creating new fans today. Uh, but I would imagine that WWE is where most people know you from. But do you have like stories from fans, you know, talking about, hey, I remember you from 1999 or 2001, <laughs> like because your career is is very different from how a lot of wrestlers come up today. Yeah, so um, I've had people come up to me from San Antonio um, who were at the shows at Far West Rodeo, which I don't think even exists anymore, um, and, the, and the shows that we did there. I've had people from like Memphis, because I was in developmental when WWE had a Memphis um, developmental system. Like I've had people from all over, uh, from all different time periods. I, um, in 2003, and I did this three times, I w I'd go to England, and I'd work predominantly Butlins shows, which were, um, for people who aren't aware of what Butlins is, and Butlins is like a um, all-in-one entertainment package that are usually seaside towns where you go, and it's all-inclusive entertainment. You go, you get... You know, you can you get food, you get there's all this entertainment there, and the wrestling is just part of the entertainment. They're not wrestling fans. So, like in 2003, I went there for six months and just had the time of my life. Went back in 2005, went back again in 2008 uh, for months at a time, and the and I've had people come to me who said I watched you as a kid when you were at Butlins, and I was like. Oh my gosh, because those people weren't necessarily even wrestling fans. Wrestling was just part of the entertainment. And the wrestling wasn't like Ring of Honor style wrestling or AEW style wrestling. It was, what What about wrestling will entertain the masses? In like, you know, and it's like a an hour and 15 minute show or an hour and a half show at most, you know. And so, um, and so yeah, I've had people from all over. Uh, it's also funny because I get, and this is predominantly women, um, but they come up to me and they, oh my gosh, are oh, you total, total, are yeah. you that guy from the show? And I was yeah. like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm the I'm the guy from that show, whatever that <laughs> is, right? You know, and so it's like, yeah, and so uh, so yeah, people from all all different have come at it from all different angles. I wanted to bring up before, you know, we ran out of time, Zack Sabre Jr., just because um, he's a marvelous wrestler. <laughs> and, <laughs> and this year you beat him for the, the best technical, but he had won years, many, many years in a row. And I know that you are a big fan of his. As, as I, You know, it's funny because people think that, like, a certain wrestlers are, are, like, my favorite. And I'm not sure that Zack isn't my favorite of anyone <laughs> because I just, I just love that style. But, I mean, that, that's like a... I mean, it's definitely a hard, a, not a hardcore blood and gut style, It's, but it's a hardcore wrestling style. Like, it's just so entertaining to me, you know, watching that. And, and, and watching you, your style, it's different, but it's in, in, in some ways similar. You know, like, uh, you know, like um, a, a, lot, a lot of the New Japan guys are to do, a, do a, an aspect of that anyway. But um, I know that, like, everyone always talks about Brian Danielson versus Zack Sabre Jr. And Zack Sabre Jr. even brought it up in a couple of promos in the last couple of months and everything like that. Um, I mean, is that like a dream match or is that just something that you, you would like to do, but you're not obsessing by it or anything like that? So, uh, I mean, I, I'm not obsessing over anything these days. I'm trying <laughs> to, uh, the things that I desire, I try to make less and less and less more so than anything else. But the idea of wrestling Zach, uh, 
sounds like to me a lot of fun. And one of the things that I think is that um, professional wrestling has evolved. And Zach has taken um, technical wrestling and evolved it in a very specific way that is influencing a lot of people. And I think it's marvelous what, what he's done and some of the things that he comes up with to me is genius and just so, so fun. And so it's like, so that's actually the kind, one of the things that I think too is, um, Zach's style of wrestling is the kind of, is the style of wrestling that I like most, you know, from a, from a watching perspective. Um, and so, so yeah, I think he's done, I just think he's done a fantastic job and I'd love to, the, the thing that I think would be interesting is me wrestling him and then the, then the striking exchanges combined with the grappling. That's actually one of the things that I'm most excited about with my match with Moxley tomorrow. So you talk about me winning the best technical wrestling award, but Moxley also, I think, won the best brawler, right? Yes, yes, he did. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but he's a brawler who also uses like submissions and stuff like that. And that's fascinating to me. And I'm a technician who also l- likes to use a lot of violence. And so that those, those are fat, those are, those are inter- interesting, fascinating concepts to work with. And then in the same sense, Zack Sabre Jr., it's like, okay, the the technical wizardry. But really, is it going to be any more technical than the matches he's had with Will Ospreay and that sort of thing? Because those were as, you know, as much as Will's known as for the spectacular things he does, some of the stuff that they were doing in there, like is, it, is the wrestling going to be any any better than that or is it going to be the the gravity lent to the wrestling and the striking exchanges in between the wrestling is going to make the wrestling seem better and so those are all those are all interesting things that go through my mind well you know the one thing when when we talk about you and moxley who you know obviously big match tomorrow but um one of the things is both of you are fans i mean and and not just fans i mean train in mixed martial arts i mean in in the sense i mean that's his main i don't know if it's his main training but it's you know that and powerlifting right it's like pretty much his his workouts are mma workouts and he's a big mma fan and i know that you know you've watched it and i noticed that the, the wrestlers who um like you know train in mma have a different style in the sense of there's a lot you know it feels like there's more tricks in the trade you know what i mean it's like you can do because mma involves like mma is not just arm drag and twist and you know shoulder block and everything like that and there it encompasses so much because real is there's so many a million real things that haven't even been discovered and some that we see in the fights every week um it just seems like that there's, you know, there's so much more of a variety and that's, that gives you like more, I don't know, did you, did you feel like it gives you more tools? Because like, I mean, when you started, you know, MMA was in its infancy and the generation before you, there was no such thing. So it's like, yeah, were some jujitsu people doing triangle chokes in the eighties? Yes. But nobody ever saw it and nobody knew what it was. And if you did it, you know unless you were a Fujiwara or something, nobody even knew what you were doing anyway, and they didn't really get it, but they got the, the selling of it. So in, in that sense, like, how... Do, do you feel if you if you work with somebody, you know, whether it's Mojo or whatever, that their knowledge of MMA or their training in MMA gives you, like, a wider variety of things that you can put into a match? Uh, e- e- yes, um... But that to me isn't the most important thing that where I think it's valuable. I think you get a better feel for what feels real and what and what doesn't. And there are things obviously like running the ropes that are just ingrained in the psyche of professional wrestling that uh, that don't make any sense. But that you never. Never would you be able to whip somebody off into the ropes and they just bounce back. Right? <laughs> It's just, it's just not, it's just not a thing. So when people say like, ah, oh, wrestling back in my day used to feel more real. Well, they were still hitting the ropes, which is 
probably the dumbest thing that you could possibly do. Um, <laughs> but uh, but one of the things that that I think the people who have have done that or even like amateur wrestled or kickboxed or whatever it is, you know, is the the things that feel natural in a fight and using that sort of thing. But I do think, you know, I do think there, there's a lot of things that can be added to your repertoire. So, for example, so this is something that I've been really interested in because I work on a lot of things. And now that with the pandemic and then I'm with AEW. And so at most, you know, this, this week I'll, I'll have wrestled twice, but most weeks at most I'll wrestle once. Um, so I'll take an example of what I've, something I've been working on that I haven't even done anything with yet is half Nelson stuff. Because I was like, I just became enamored with some catch wrestling, half Nelson stuff. And for my legitimate grappling. And then I was like, Oh man, nobody's doing half Nelson work in pro wrestling. Like, and there's some really cool stuff. And the idea of transferring that into pro wrestling is just very useful. The idea of, um, John Danaher has done and his squad of like, uh, Gary Tonin and, um, Oh gosh, what's, what's the, the, He's the best known one. He's the one who's like the who's winning all the no gi stuff. I forget. I forget what his name uh, is. The Ryan's maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. Gordon Ryan. Gordon, Gordon Ryan. Ryan. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they, you know, uh, all the leg lock stuff that they were doing from all these different positions is just so infinitely interesting, and uh, and the and the positions and everything, and so and I think. Some of those positions are are fantastic for pro wrestling. You saw a little bit of it when I wrestled um, Daniel Garcia. Like we were doing some of that kind of stuff without any without any intention of doing it. So one of the things that I've really enjoyed about AEW. So I did I wrestled Lee Moriarty one week, and then the very next week I wrestled Daniel Garcia. And rather than saying I'm the veteran, I'm going to take the lead in this match, um, and uh, and this is, uh, listen here, kid, this is how it's going to go. <laughs> I'm, I'm interested to see what they think about pro wrestling because they come at it from a different point of view than I do. And so when I, when I wrestled Lee and when I wrestled Garcia, I was like, what do you guys want to do? What is interesting to you about this match? And both of them, I was very impressed with both of them. And they're both kind of thing is they had a couple of like ideas, things, but then they also just kind of said, yeah. And part of us just wants to just go out there and wrestle. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. And like, you know, on live TV, never having wrestled either of them, you know what I mean? And so the, in the Garcia match specifically, um, we got time cut right before we go out there. As we're out there, we're, we're, and we're the end of the show. So it's like, hey, this, this thing drops dead. <laughs> this show <laughs> drops dead at 10 o'clock, right? And so we're having to to alter things out there. And I think his background in legitimate wrestling really helped, right? Because this, because of the style that we were wrestling and the stuff that we were doing. And unless you knew what we were going to do, the editing of that, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have even known that we did anything different. You know what I mean? And so, uh, so I, I think that's where it re- that's that. Those are some of the ways where it really helps you. I've kind of, when people have asked me, like, hey, you know, what can I do outside of outside of here, outside of training in the ring? Because most people don't have access to a ring on a regular basis. Um, I, you know, obviously watching a lot of wrestling, get, you know, seeing all the different possibilities, but also like working with somebody like working with like a Muay Thai coach or working on your jujitsu or something, even if you don't use any of those things in a wrestling ring, they give you the idea of what a fight feels like. If you, you know, I'm, I can't do sparring with kickboxing anymore with my concussions, but, but just the idea of like, okay, this is what it's like to stand, stand with somebody who, not that they're trying to hurt you, but they're, you know, you're trying to win. You know, what does that feel like? You know, and that's a different, I'm not an actor. I'm not somebody who can, if you were to tell me, um, display on your face right now, anguish, I'd be like, oh gosh, like, (laughs) 
And like, that's, that's part of my job. Right. But I think I've gotten better at it over the years, not because I've become a better actor, but because I've experienced more pain and okay. Like now I know, now I know more what pain feels like. So I can kind of recall that and um, that sort of thing. I know what it feels like to be in a struggle for, for leg locks. And when I miss a heel hook, and then they really catch me with something. Oh God, that sucks. Right. And so like the, the, the desperation to get out of that and, you know, and then, uh, you know, also observing other things. And I also, you know, I take a lot of, I take pro wrestling from anything. You know what I mean? My, you know, I observe things around me and then I incorporate almost everything that I observe in some, in some way, shape or form into, into my part of pro wrestling but uh but i yeah i think that's really cool and something that you can really i don't i don't know if you really need it going forward but i i'm starting to think more and more that you do what about the theatrics side of mma people oh. noticed uh the the, the well, double your, bicep your, your, your finish is you know nate diaz and um or one of your finishes and yeah. You know, I mean, and, and, and I know I remembered when you were in, in WWE, I mean, there would be times where we'd watch a fight on Saturday night and there you were on Raw and I'd go like, you watch that fight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because there'd be yeah. like a, just a quick moment, but I would notice it, you know. So oh, well, well, and there were probably a million other times where I had watched uh, <laughs> Gordon Ryan. <laughs> or somebody <laughs> of that ilk, you know, in a in a in in an Abu Dhabi grappling match or something like that, where nobody nobody in the world would have picked up on it except me. You know, there's a great um, there's a great book on creativity by uh, I forget what his name is, but from the roots, Quest and he Love. Talk- well, yeah, yeah, Quest Love, and he taught, and it really struck me. I thought it was just a wonderful book, and he he said. People think that I'm creative, but they just don't know all of my influences, the massive amounts of music that I've listened to and the different things that have have influenced me. And so because of that, you start he's, he talks about starting off like imitating these people that you really like. But through that imitation and through all these different things, you develop your own thing and people start to think of it as creativity, but it's really just the influence of all these other things that have come into your brain. And that's when I read that, I was like, that's me in pro wrestling. If people knew all the different influence, they wouldn't think I was creative at all. (laughs) Okay, I have a very selfish question here. Uh, This relates to 2014. Uh, Hunter Pence from the San Francisco Giants started to do the Yes chant, which is influenced by you. And I don't know if he knew the influence that you got that from. But um, Giants won the World Series. There's a there's a parade in San Francisco, and I'm you know on the seventh floor of my building taking photos of you and 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 all these people at the parade. Now, I mean, th- this isn't even. I don't even uh, know exactly uh, how that stuff works, but obviously WWE and you know works with all these different companies. But like, did, were were you able to have some sort of friendship with with Hunter Pence, or, or or was that all just sort of like put together by WWE? Because very quickly when he started doing that, wrestling fans were like, I, I know exactly where you're getting that from, and then you know, he would start talking about you. And then, you know, obviously at the, I think you were at one of the, uh, one of the playoff games and then obviously at the, the parade there. Yeah. I, one of the playoff games, I did the let's play ball or something like that. And then, yeah, you know, it was really funny because Hunter Pence didn't even know it was from me. Right. Oh, really? Oh, was it like he, Michigan state or something? Yeah. He saw it from Michigan state and the, the guy from Michigan state who did that definitely got it from me. But like, uh, but, but Hunter Pence had no idea that it was even from me, let alone that I I got it from Diego Sanchez. Right. And so, um, so it was really interesting talking to him about it because, you know, he wasn't, it wasn't like he was a big fan or anything like that. He was like, Oh yeah, man, that thing's really cool. Thanks. (laughs) It's not like we even exchanged numbers or anything like that. You know what I mean? And so, uh, so yeah, that was, that was kind of all there was to it. 
Um, but the interesting thing to me about that was, like, so they win. You've got the World Series champions doing the S chant, and they didn't really make any mention of it on TV, which I thought yeah. was a little bit. I don't know. It was, uh, you know, there weren't there weren't many times when I when I felt like, um, where they they didn't have my back WWE, but that was one of the things where I was where it just. I just was like, oh, well, like, if the World Series champions were doing John Cena's You Can't See Me or we something like that, you would, you would see so much of it. You know what I mean? And so it's like, I was like, oh. And earlier that year, because I had to have neck surgery, so that was during the time off. Um, earlier that year, there was just like, I had had a, I had had a conversation where it was just like, yeah, you know, we'd, we'd like to do, but then we'd like this to happen. And it was almost, it almost felt like, oh, and then, and then you're just going to kind of go back to being whatever you were before. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's interesting. I was like, okay. And so, uh, so yeah, but, but that was actually, you know, people think that that was my entire relationship with WWE and it wasn't like, um, you know, I, I, de- I ended up developing a, a very, what I felt like was a close bond with Vince but you know a lot of that too was the forced retirement and coming out of it it was it was a lot of stuff for both me but also for them right and so and that kind of stuff brings you closer and and so I you know I had a couple of those in that period right where I felt like oh they may be trying to suppress any sort of like any like me getting over but then all of that kind of just just went away, and uh, and it didn't it like it didn't feel like that at all anymore. So so yeah, but that was one of the things that I really remember from that parade. One, all that, and my arms being very tired because I had to do the yes chance throughout that entire parade. <laughs> and whenever I stopped, there was somebody there to kind of like nudge me on, being like, "Hey, yeah, you know, people want to people want to see the yes guy do the yes thing." So if you stop raising your arms up and down. I was like, oh my gosh, do you know how hard it is to do this for, for an hour? You know, with the one thing, I mean, I mean, I, I don't want to be too negative on WWE or anything, but the one thing that I've always noticed is like, like, okay, like they will accept anyone who's good at a certain level and everything, but it's like, like, I mean, and I, I, I always hate this term. I used to hate this term when I watched football as a kid, okay? I, this, this, the term I hated was, this guy's got perfect size to be a quarterback, and it was always a guy who was a marginally good quarterback who was three inches taller and 30 pounds heavier than every other quarterback who was great. Todd Burnley. Like, are you talking about Todd <laughs> Um Well, I mean, there's a lot of them. I mean, I, I know. Remember, I was just kidding. I was thinking the one of the one player that I could distinctly. When remember. I was a kid, when I was a kid, it was it was a guy named Roman Gabriel of the Los Angeles Rams, who was a very good quarterback. And all I heard is, "Oh, this guy's got perfect size to be a quarterback," and he was like the eighth best quarterback in the league. I mean, he was good, but you know, he wasn't Johnny Unitas or Bart Starr or any Mon- of the. And Montana's like six one, one ninety. Right, 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 right. And, and and later, I mean, when I grew up, I don't know if people will remember the name, although he played years in the NFL, it was a guy named Rich Campbell who was six foot five. And when I was a kid, like every NFL, I mean, as, as a kid, this guy was going to be a superstar in the NFL. And he was a great college player and he was a great quarterback. But there was a guy in his own league who beat him for all league who was 5'10", who, who played at San Jose State as a backup, who never got, who got, <laughs> this is so bad. So, our starter, this is when I'm going to San Jose State. This is right after, you know, Rich has gone, I think, went to, um, I think he might have gone to Cal, but but a guy named Jack Overstreet I went to San Jose State with. And the starter got hurt, and he was actually third team because then the second string guy got hurt on the first play, so it's, oh, we got to put the third team in, guy in. And he passes for like 400 yards for two games, and then our starter comes back, and we win. And then the starter comes back, and he's back to second string. And it's like, and this guy was an amazing player, but he's 5'10". And it's just like, maybe even 5'9", as, as I recall. But it's so it's so weird how you get that. So the, the term, of course, that I'm going through, that I hear all the time, and it was always in developmental, is we're trying to get guys who can main event WrestleMania. And I think, 
well, anyone who's good, who's hot at the time, can main event WrestleMania and be very successful at it. And you, of course, you're you main evented one of the most amazing WrestleManias ever. And Punk never main evented WrestleMania, but you know, whatever. If Dwayne wasn't there, he would have, and he could have. And you know, the timing didn't work right. And you know, Rey Mysterio could main event WrestleMania with the right story. You know, and I mean, it's there's it's not like you've got to be you know Roman Reigns to main event WrestleMania. But there's still, but even to this day, I will hear, you know, and now they're, they're scouting. We don't want anyone under, you know, 225, 61. We want real football players and, you know, college athletes and everything like that. And it's just like they come in all, you know, in all shapes and sizes. I mean, Jericho said it to me once, and I thought it was the perfect thing. He goes, the test of who can get over is who gets over. And that's it. You know, nothing more. It's not like, well, you've got to tick this button and tick this button and tick this button. I know guys who tick every button every button but somehow you put them out there or tick every box actually and and somehow they're just not the guy i mean they could be very good they could you know whatever and i know guys who may only tick you know two of the ten boxes but they drew more money than those other guys or they got more over you know it's like the only the only test of some if, if something works is is it working nothing else nothing everything else like like I always it frustrates me because I've seen so much wrestling and so many different guys who've gotten over and there's no perfect formula. You know, everything, you know what I mean? It's time, it's place, it's the right thing that clicks at that moment. And you know, like so when we go back to you, it's like obviously, you know, everyone had great respect for your ability and talking and you got over and everything like that. But there was still always that thing when I watched from watching you and your rise was yeah, but you know what I mean? But it's John. Nothing against John, right? You know, John was, you know, and, and in hindsight, I think people now recognize more than maybe when he was in his prime, just how um, important John Cena really was to that company and just how good an overall performer he was, you know, as far as being a, a, a legitimate top um, you know, generational top guy. Like, it's not like he got anything he didn't deserve. But still, you know, when you talk about the parade and everything, if it was like you said, if it was John Cena or it was Roman Reigns who came up with that, it'd be all over TV. And I just remember when when um, um, Santa Clara WrestleMania press conference and they come in and I'm looking at who's there and who's not there. And and the night before they all the guys came in from I think it was Seattle, but I could be wrong. But I know it was Pacific Northwest and I was talking to John Cena and you would just basically he was in the ring with you and it was the the right thing and the right night and blah, blah, blah. And you stole the show. And he's just kind of like laughing to me about it and goes like, you know, I'm glad, you know, it's always great to have somebody over, you know, like that. But you weren't there and not saying he shouldn't have been there because he should have been there. But Alberto Del Rio's there. Um, um, Punk's not there. A uh, giant uh, Singh, you know, Dalip Singh is there. Um, um, Mark Henry's there. Paul White is there. And I'm thinking, like, they, they, their idea of the people who, you know, are going to impress people, Alberto, you know, so we, we want the good-looking Spanish guy who's tall. We want the Giants. And then we've got John Cena and, and Paul Levesque, you know, who are, you know, our guys and whatever. And it's just like, but there's no CM Punk and there's no... Brian Danielson at this thing when they were two of the hottest guys and both can talk. And, you know, you, to me, like you talking to the media, having talked to almost everyone, I, I find you more fascinating than 98% of the guys. Okay. You know, more than whatever, a lot of the guys who do the buzzwords and everything like that. And, and punk is another one who I would say the same thing about in the sense that conversation can go in any direction. It could be really fascinating as a media person. I would rather talk to you or punk, than you know most people in this business and i think that they still think that it's all about oh we're 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 going to non-wrestling fans we want guys that look physically impressive and are good looking you know i mean no ray either you know what i mean and it was just, it was just like that day you know it was like you know it, it's one of those days of all the buzzwords and everything and i'm just thinking like God, i'm in the media and, and, you know, these other media people who don't even like wrestling are just kind of seeing this as sort of this, you know, corporate sideshow. They're coming to San, San Jose for WrestleMania and, you know, it's a nice, cute story, but there's no depth to anything. And I just remember that day, you know, thinking about, okay, this is, 
you know, I mean, this is their product and everything like that, but it could be so much more fascinating of a product if you had more fascinating type of people who were different than, you know, whatever. It's like, uh, you know, when, when my cousin met you and she was like, um, oh my God, it's like, he is not what I expected. And, you know, it's like, <laughs> what did you expect? And, and, you know, it's like, you know, she, and, you know, it's like, and she's just describing everything. So, oh, you were expecting Dave Batista. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was expecting him to be somehow more muscular. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, when I made her watch your stuff, well, she saw your, the comeback. Um, well, no, she said the retirement, the retirement thing. Cause I remember afterwards she was, oh my God. I didn't have any idea he was like this. Like I go, no, he's a big star. And so she saw the retirement thing. And it's like, and then, you know, she says, you shouldn't have retired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so, you know, it's interesting to me, um, you know, because I'm uh, in a lot of ways, I think, so I have the wrestling that I like, but I, I, as I get older, you know, some people tend to, as they get older, they, they get more narrow in the things that they like. I feel like my mind has become more open. And, um, you know, I used to not like a lot of, so for example, too much high spot wrestling. But then, you know, who really changed my mind on that is uh, the Young Bucks, kind of. Me in too. I would, watch, I would watch them while I was in WWE. And they are still doing the high spots, but they're telling such compelling stories. And it's like, why can't you, like, in a mar- in a martial arts movie, you know, there uh, there can be a ton of action that's sometimes hard to follow, but still tells a story, right? And especially now with like people's shorter attention spans and all that kind of stuff, like I, you know, I really, en- I, I've come to really enjoy watching them wrestle right and different different people with different styles and so anyways all of that to say um i don't necessarily i i like the i like the aspect of the variety show of wrestling and giving people different things i think tomorrow for the pay-per-view i think we've got a lot of that but there's gonna a lot of different style matches but i also don't want to fault to me like one of the things that i feel like was helped to get me over one it was just the right time and place people were a little bit sick of the same people on top and they were rebelling against the same people on top but also at the time and maybe even a little bit now but a little but less because at the time there was no brand split and so you were we were doing five hours of television every week with the same people so the bigger question was who could handle overexposure and who's going to handle overexposure the best is the people who know how to fill the most time with the best wrestling. You know, now, so I think if it was still like a combined r- roster and if um, if the people on top had to do the same kind of thing that was happening in 2013 and 2014 where it's like, okay, so there was one, Roman Reigns and I did a program in 2015 where between Raw and SmackDown, we did 12 segments of television in one week, which, if you don't know, the entirety of SmackDown is 11 segments. So that's like over two hours of TV time for just me and Roman in one in one week. So it's like it's not just every people have to be able to handle overexposure. They have to be able to handle things constantly changing. They have to handle start and stop pushes. And so I don't even think who gets over is a good gauge of who could get over anymore. (laughs) Because I I see so many people who I just think, oh man, like, uh, like he's great and he can talk and he can do these things, but then this happens or then this happens, you know what I mean? And so now, and now, you know, I think we're, is everybody in AEW who could be over, are they all over? And the answer is no. And it's because you have a finite amount of television and so many talented people. So then at some point you do have to pick and choose and you have to pick and choose uh, using a certain, you you have to have reasons why you're picking and choosing so-and-so, such and such person over this, over this person. And one of the things that I could argue kind of 
against your point a little bit, not to say that I completely disagree with it, but I would say that like a lot of those people that they have picked to give opportunities to are very talented and potentially could have gotten over in the right setting, but didn't because it wasn't the right setting. And in the same sense, I consider myself lucky too, because there are some very talented people in WWE who didn't reach necessarily my level um, of main eventing WrestleMania, but who still had very good careers, uh, but who they were just, it was never their thing at the right time where they could really force the issue. Like me main eventing WrestleMania was like, a oh, it's a bunch of flukes. Uh, yeah, it was a series of flukes. It wasn't even just the fans. It was a whole series of flukes that was like, that ended up with, well, the only solution we've got is for Brian to main event and win. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and, and, so, and, and how much of that depends on my skill level versus just circumstance. And, and so that's, you know, I, I try to constant, try to constantly look at that. And when we, you know, because I was also part of the creative team, you know, you, you're also trying to satisfy what, what Vince wants, right. For, for stuff. But I feel like a lot of the decisions they, they make are good decisions, but then things change. And then they don't seem like good decisions. <laughs> so, so that's that's kind of, um, you know, because I think a lot of talented people have fallen by the wayside. You know, we just, um, Eric Redbeard was just on Rampage last night. We'll be part of the um, opening of the, the pay-per-view tomorrow. And, you know, he was somebody who, like, he's, for how big he is, he's so unique. He's so talented. Like, he's... It's really, it's really interesting to me that that was somebody that they let go. And then all of a sudden he's got like something in a cage under a thing. And I was like, whoa, we were just, we were just doing a story with him and Roman Reigns. <laughs> like what happened? <laughs> and so, yeah. So I think a lot of it is like circumstance and things changing too. Not necessarily people's ability to get over. All right. So uh, we're getting very close to the end here. So we should probably go back to the pay-per-view uh, that is tomorrow. So you have a match with John Moxley. Uh, you have set a very high bar for expectation based on your current AEW run. Um, so it, is there a, you know, you, you talked about, you know, the best brawler against uh, the, the Brian Danielson award winner. So it should be a very unique match, I think. But do you ever, you mentioned you're not super competitive, but do you ever worry about, when there's a, a match that, that you have that, you know, so many people are looking forward to. Do you ever get, you know, not nervous is probably not the right word, but do you ever worry about, you know, what that expectation is and, and whether you guys can deliver? Uh, no. Um, so I'm not somebody who necessarily worries about that, especially since, you know, I used to. Um, but especially since I've come back from retirement, I don't really, I don't really worry about that. Uh, I also... It gives me a little bit of peace of mind knowing I'm not the main event. <laughs> so, uh, so you know, that's you know, I don't know of anybody. I don't even know if Tony has decided on the the match order yet. You know, um, so but just knowing, just knowing that I'm not on last makes me feel makes me feel good about it. But no, um, I I try not to put any of that kind of pressure on myself. I don't feel like it's helpful for me um, as an individual. I I'm mostly interested in is what i'm doing intriguing to me i feel like if it's intriguing to me it's going to be intriguing to other people uh also i'm interested in having fun um and going out there and just feeling feeling everything there is to feel the good and the bad about wrestling and and yeah and then also uh <laughs> there's a part of me as horrible as this sounds like I'm not a very aggressive person just in general, but there's a part of me that loves that just like surge of aggression, even if it's not entirely 100% real. 
Like, I like that, right? And sometimes after matches, I just have this kind of buzz about me, right? That I'm just like, I'm just feeling like, I feel so good. It's very, it's very difficult to explain. I feel like um, human language oftentimes fails with the best, like with the things that are the coolest about being human. And, and yeah, so that post match feeling of something that I'm really excited about or that, uh, that a match that feels really big to me, that the way I felt after the Kenny match, after the, after I wrestled Eddie Kingston, even, even like I wrestled Dustin Rhodes and the way that I felt after, right. was just so cool to after the, after the hour draw with hangman page and then the, the, the follow up, like it, it's just this, it's getting to this weird place that, that there's no words to express how I feel, how I feel after those matches to any other human being. Like even my wife is like, you're so different. <laughs> after you wrestle really yeah it's just like so uh a really neat example of this is i wrestled kofi kingston at wrestlemania 35 which may have been my favorite match that i did in wwe um but i came back and my daughter was there and like i love my my daughter so much but it was almost like it opened up even more senses to feeling like when I saw her, it, it like it was such there was such feeling and such emotion there and such endless love and picking her up and hugging her. And I could like it was unlike anything else, although I've experienced things like that since. Um, but, yeah, so so that. So all of that to say, no, I'm, I'm not worried about what other people think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, okay, okay but, 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 but as far as, okay, so, so going in your first match in AEW is with, with Kenny Omega and yeah. on their, their biggest, in front of their biggest crowd that they've ever had. Yep. And, um, you know, it's, it's like a landmark thing for you because it's your first match in months and like anything but a top 10 match of the year, people are going to go, Oh man. <laughs> you know, so it's like, it was like when I watched that and you know, that match, I'm going like, you know, if this match is like anything but great, I'm going to have to read all these people shitting on this like match. That's undoubtedly going to be very, very good and probably great. And when it was over, it's like, well, if anyone says anything negative, then, you know, you need to laugh it off because it was just, they totally killed it. Um, but it's like, did, did you go in like you didn't go in with any pressure at all you were just gonna have fun no matter what or did you go in there and go like you know it's like people's been dreaming about this match and there's like 300 people in the world who actually saw it and it was 11 years ago or whatever it was you know what i mean it's like so it's all it's basically a new dream match that people thought they'd never see and now they're seeing it and it better not be half ass or you well, know no, it was kind of well, like that was the, i did put pressure on myself for that match but it wasn't because I was worried about the reaction to it. I I was putting pressure on myself. I wanted to I wanted to kind of make a statement as far as what this this is your this is your new entry point for what Brian Danielson is, right? And so this is what I want to be. And that was the pressure that I was putting myself uh, that I was putting on myself was not was not I, you know, I didn't know what the reaction was going to be. You know, I assumed it was. I assumed it was. We were going to get a really good reaction, just based on crowd reactions and stuff that we had leading leading up to that. But um, but mostly, I wanted the work to be something that I was proud of, and that something that was indicative of what I was going to do going forward. All right, so uh, I think that is a good place to stop here. We uh, we, we we really appreciate all the time that that you. Oh yeah, gave thanks us for all the time. The yeah, I, I honestly, I just looked at my phone and I didn't <laughs> was, you know, I, I I enjoy talking about wrestling. You know what I mean, and and all the things that we talked about that weren't wrestling. <laughs> even if other even if other people fast forward through that part, you know, like <laughs> you definitely went over your hour sc screen time limit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My hour my my hour screen time is shot. Between that and FaceTiming my wife, yeah. <laughs> so. 
So uh, I think most, uh, probably a lot of the people who listen to this are already uh, going to buy the pay-per-view. But if you haven't, uh, the pay-per-view, you can find it uh, wherever you get pay-per-views. And the Bleacher Report app is the, the streaming app. But uh, yeah, AEW. Fight, 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 fight TV outside the United States. But yeah, AEW Revolution, uh, Brian Danielson and John Moxley is one of those matches. And it is the one that I am looking forward to the most, which says a lot because like has been said looking, that the card I am is looking very forward stacked. to a lot of this card. <laughs> you know, so yeah. But it's it's like, yeah, I mean it's like it's a I, I don't know. I think it's like a I think it's a can't miss match and I think there's about six or seven can't miss matches on this show. It's really it's a it's a it's a deep show. Like uh, one of the deepest that I've probably ever seen. Yeah, I think I don't know. I just think it's going to be really if you're if you're a wrestling fan who has the money. I don't want anybody to spend mon- the money who doesn't have it, especially in this economy. But you know, if you're a wrestling fan who has the ability to watch it, I I, I really think that this is something that will that that you'll enjoy. That will be worth that you after you watch it, you'll be like that was that was worth the money. You know, that's just my opinion. And uh, and people may disagree. So, <laughs> is there anything else you would like to promote before we get out of here? Oh yeah. Uh, so I have. Um, I'd like to promote people getting off of social media. <laughs> and and uh, my, I'm not going to name my Twitter account or my Instagram account. Uh, <laughs> and and also, um, and, but but just but more so than any of that. What I would really like to say is to all the the listeners of this, um, just thank you for all the wrestling fans' support. Because as much as like we talked about the idea of the negativity on Twitter and stuff and that sort of thing that can engulf wrestling, it's actually my experience with fans has been so incredibly positive that. Um, but I'm just really grateful for, for all the people who continue to support our industry because like all entertainment, like we we make our livings because you guys enjoy what we do. And so so just just thank you to all the, the listeners who are listening to this or who have supported, you know, anything that that we've done in the past or will support in the future. And I, to me, that's that's the biggest takeaway. I don't need it. You guys have given me enough. I don't need anything else. All right. Well, uh, Dave and Brian Alvarez will be back. Back later tonight after the UFC show, and I'm sure talking uh, the news that Dave tweeted out earlier on, uh, on Twitter <laughs> today. Um, but uh, thank you to Brian Danielson uh, for Brian for Dave. I am Garrett. To everyone, thanks for listening. <laughs>